picture books are considered a genre, but what's true about them is that they actually comprise as many genres as any other art form. You know, there's there's not a picture book type of story. Every type of story is a picture book story. It just needs to be applied correctly to the form. That's Taylor Norman, an editor at Chronicle Books here in San Francisco. And what she said is rather poignant because when you start thinking about kids' books or picture books or children's books, some of the ubiquitous titles that come to mind, of course, are Everybody Poops, Green Eggs and Ham, or one of their newer titles, Everyone's Awake. Picture books have this aura, this lure to them that everybody wants to make a children's book or everyone thinks they can make a children's book. And, and why not? When you look at the prices of $10.99, $17.99, some are even more than $20 a piece, you realize that this is a multi-million dollar industry. And if you're an illustrator, the peak of your career can be doing a children's book. And as an art student, you're going to be spending time learning how to illustrate for different audiences. This is a bit of a long episode, so grab a pen and paper. Taylor's going to give you a masterclass in what it takes to get your book published. So please enjoy. I am very, very excited about this because when we talked earlier about this, uh, like every art school grad, parent, former teacher you've probably met, grandmother, person has pitched you a book, thinks they can do a children's book, has a better idea of doing a children's book. It's now your job in the next 90 minutes to explain to us how the children's book world works from an editor. Yeah, great. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really excited to talk about this. It's like, it's a very small industry, but I think it's very interesting and especially relevant for all of the listeners to this podcast because we kind of think of books as this finished product that are that they're like beautifully designed and and then you buy them but there's a whole lot that goes into the making of them and like you said an editor is one of those jobs that you cannot tell people you have at a party because they will have a book for you <laughs> really terrible here's for, my like, book Uber if you're, if you're really if you're free. <laughs> yeah 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 you can't say it's amazing like everyone has has a story which you know is a beautiful and also sometimes tedious thing about, <laughs> especially this country. Yeah. We're going to get into that because I don't know how many yeah. copies of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star I actually <sighs> need at this point. Yeah. Well, we, we have we have definitely more to talk about there. So I am a children's book editor at Chronicle Books in San Francisco. I work on everything from board books, which is tiny books that are for the infants to like two years old, um, all the way up through novels for kids. Um, the bulk of what I work on are picture books which are mainly for ages like three to eight, usually kind of four to eight is the sweet spot. Sweet spot. Those are generally books that are read to a child rather than the child reading them on their own. Um, and then I work on some early readers and chapter books, which is when kids are starting to read on their own and learning words. You know, Frog and Toad is a great example of that kind of category. And then I also work on novels for kids who are totally reading on their own, and that's more in the middle grade category. So those start around like age eight and up. And for, kind of for people out to, to understand that YA, which has become so popular yeah. in the last 10 years, that's yeah. junior high or high school? Yeah, YA we normally say is 12 and up, ages Got 12 okay. and up. Um, and obviously, you know, kids always read above their age level. So when you're eight, you're normally reading about 10 year olds or, you're, you know, if you're really advanced, you're reading um, older than that. Um, okay. The reason for that sort of distinction is more for content than for difficulty it's about you know if if it's a 12 and up book it might have romance in it if it's sure. a 14 and up book it might Puberty have drugs or so, yeah exactly so yeah. that's kind of where YA comes in and that's its its own sort of genre and I'm not I don't personally work on those as much anymore I sort of tap out around age 12 okay. there's plenty to go on there <laughs> but picture books which we're going to yeah. kind of focus on a little bit only because here at the academy we're in art school, so illustrate, a lot of illustrators uh, and a lot of illustrators want to or end up going into the world of picture books. And it seems like picture books is this awesome, just golden room of I get to make beautiful things and people just throw money at me and my book <laughs> comes out and there it is. But I'm guessing that's a little bit different. What in your mind is a picture book what 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 do you look at it from your perspective and then from the professional perspective what's a picture book i'm so glad you asked that because i think that is something that it's really hard to 
um, kind of understand picture books from a critical perspective for a lot of people because um, it's beautiful. We have such an emotional tie to the genre. We either spend a lot of time reading them with our own kids or we have these, you know, clear, precious memories of reading them with our parents when we were kids ourselves. But what we forget is that it's its own it's its own art form. It's not just text that has pictures next to it. It's actually a discrete object in which the text and the images complement each other in some way. So either the images expand on the text, sometimes they undermine the text. That can be really funny or it can be really interesting when you're you're seeing one thing on the page but the text is telling you something else and so you have to decide is that a joke am i in on a secret that the text isn't telling me what i think it's important to remember about picture books is that they are their own they are their own art form and they're separate you know it's such a different mindset to be writing a, a story for a picture book than it is to be writing a story for even even an early reader because part of your brain as an author or if you're an illustrator, part of your brain is going to be thinking, what do these words that I'm putting on the paper make the illustrator draw? So you're constantly sort of, you are accounting for an absence on the page. And that's like, that's the goal. If you write a story and it is totally comprehensible without pictures, then it doesn't need to be a picture book. A great picture book relies on its images. Yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And like you, you're saying, it is a piece of art, and and we'll go through some of the different titles and and in doing some of my own research heavily in the last three years because I've got a three year old <laughs> now. You start yeah. looking at books, and and I'm sure a lot of people do. You know, grandparents, aunts, uncles. You know, if you're stuck in a bookstore and you you happen to wander over to the kids section, you see some books that are amazing. We have artists now like Grizz Grimley, who's now doing stuff that are now becoming movies. And we all know Dr. Seuss. And some mm-hmm. of us of certain ages literally grew up with reading Rainbow. Yep. And the books are, ex- books are expensive. A good yep. book is really expensive. A cheap book can be good, but a cheap book is really, really cheap. <laughs> and then we get into the thing that you talked about with text. One of the books that I found, it's a, it's a book from 91. It's a book called Tuesday. Mm-hmm. It's a Caldecott winner, I did not realize. Yeah, it's, it's a great book. It's done by David Weisner or David Wiesner. Mm-hmm. It has three pages of text in the 28 pages of the book. Mm-hmm. And the book, the, the, the illustrations are, I mean, they're movie poster level. I mean, they're stunning. Yeah. I may not let yeah. my kid touch this book for a while. <laughs> but it's three pages of text. Right. I mean, part of what I think the author's job is, and this happens sometimes, the author's job, and, and uh, you know, we're talking to people, some of whom are able, who are have the gift of being able to write and illustrate for themselves, which is amazing. So they can be thinking about this component of, like, their brain is being sort of split into these two things. But people who only write picture books, part of what they're doing is having the idea for how the stories will work. So I've definitely gotten manuscripts from authors that are scripting out storyboarding basically a wordless book Um, and that happens sometimes and you'll see you know a wordless book that has an author and an illustrator and like well what did the author do Um, the author is still behind those decisions you know unless the illustrator is also the author Um, but that's that's like you know part of I think it can be really hard for people who don't do art I know a lot of people who just do um, the text and it's frustrating to not be able to do the art because you know exactly you know how the book is meant to move visually, but you don't, you don't necessarily have the capacity to do that. I also know authors who, you know, in turning in a manuscript will turn in like little stick figure drawings of what they mean so that they, they like kind of account for a storyboarding because, you know, a good picture book text, like I said, it really does rely on its images. And so there's going to be a point at which the person who's only able to do text has to throw their hands up and say, here's where this goes. And a lot of times, you know, even in a, totally normal amount of words, you know, in an 800 word manuscript, an author is still going to have art notes that they include because they have expectations for what's going to go there. And that isn't saying like, this kid has blonde hair. That's saying more like, when he opens the box, you know, it can be really fun to throw to an illustrator because when he opens the, you know, Christmas gift, a surprise jumps out. You don't have to say a boa constrictor jumps out. You can let the illustrator decide what the surprise that jumps out is if you're only the author. 
the divide between sort of text and images, it is a little bit blurry. And, and I think it comes down to like how the story visually is going to move. That decision is the author's, at least as far as sort of the scope of it, what happens in the details, that is up to the illustrator. Okay, so that that's, the, I think, the first part for us to really jump in to of if somebody wants to pitch a book and we're and we're going to we'll talk about bad pitches later. And maybe a little bit now, but somebody who actually is taking this seriously is going is putting together a children's book, not just I've got this great idea for a story. If they're coming to a publisher or they're looking to have a book, they get their book published as the author, the, the person writing the text, what are you as an editor looking to see and hoping to find when this manuscript comes in? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first thing I look for in a manuscript, for, especially for a picture book, is a consideration of the art. Because if I, ha I get a lot of a lot of the submissions I get from people who are writing for the first time, they are just short stories, basically. Sometimes they'll have sort of a line or two returned every couple of sentences, and that will feel like a picture book to the person writing it. But if they haven't thought about the art at all, then it isn't a picture book. It's just a short story, you know, a, a, a kind of, you know, below a thousand words um, and a simple story usually. And that's sort of the first red flag for me if it's sort of short, simple, doesn't think about the art at all. That feels like somebody who has an idea um, <laughs> and maybe has told this idea to their own children at bedtime several times and gotten some applause from their kids, but hasn't actually thought about, like, is this going to translate to the wider world? And how does this become not just something I can recount out loud, but a, but an actual physical object that relies on its images? And and, that, and that's a good distinction to make, I think, because as as you're telling me that, I'm thinking like a, a good short story in and of itself is amazing. That's that's hard to do. Really uh, hard to do. Yeah, and, totally. And you know, you know, blo a blog post is 500 words, but you know that doesn't mean anything. But uh, you know, if you've ever read a short story, you're like, wow, that's a that's 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 a difficult feat. Um, yeah. And then like you were saying that a kids or a children's book or a picture book is 800 words or less, sometimes mm -hmm. far less. It seems like. Um, you really have, is it, is it being a wordsmith or is it being, is it more about the text on the page? And if you've answered this, it's, it's, I'm, I'm just going to keep asking because it's, it's hard for yeah, me to yeah. clarify. Is it more about the actual words, the actual text on the page, or does it come into the whole concept of that book? It's more to me about the whole concept because the words, you know, words can be edited to work for the concept. But if the if the overall sort of vision doesn't account for something visual, um, then it's sort of a misunderstanding of the art form, really. Like, it, it needs to be visual. It needs to rely on the illustrations in some way. It's not decorative text, right? It's not like an old Bible that has kind of art pieces throughout. It's it's something, it's a, it's a whole product. And the other thing that, like, I think is really important about picture books is, like I said at the beginning, most of them are read out loud. So if somebody hasn't thought about what that's going to be like to read this text out loud, and, you know, that can there's a whole category of, of things you're looking for when you're reading out loud, but an understanding of the way the book is actually going to function is important to, to the success of the project overall. And, you know, there are books that can be read aloud that are very sweet, intimate stories and are read between a parent and a child. There's big bombastic stories that are perfect, like boom, chicka, boom, boom, like that, or chicka, chicka, boom, boom. That is a perfect classroom read, like, because you can get audience participation, you can get your kids involved. There's many different definitions of what a successful read aloud is, but like if you don't get that about the book, then you kind of don't know what you're writing with a picture book. Then you're sort of just like want to be published is kind of my <laughs> take. Right. And, and, and we'll talk about self-publishing later. Too, sure. So I want to get yeah. into self-publishing yeah. a little bit if we can. But what are some of those those genres then for, for people to think about? You said read aloud. You had a more intimate, you know, mother, son, father, daughter. I'm going to you're going to sit in my lap. It's bedtime, you know, like a uh, uh, good night moon. Sure. Yeah. Or a good night construction site where it's like, you know, this is our winding down for the mm -hmm. day type mm -hmm. story. What are some of those different genres or, or, or subject areas? 
Yeah. So let's see. Like, I think when I think about read aloud books, there's sort of, there's a, there's one, like I said, that's great for a classroom read. Um, you can t- think about different audience participation levels that you can achieve through the course of your book. So if you have sort of a, you know, a page turn that relies on you saying like, should he go through that door and all the kids go, no, like that's a really great tool for sort of moving a plot along. Um, uh, you know, of course, good night books are probably the most common books <laughs> in the industry. Yeah, there's because so many twinkle twinkle books. <laughs> there's so many twinkle twinkle and there's so many I mean those in ABC books are probably the most common submissions I see because everybody's sort of like, Well, don't we need an ABC of robots? And like it's all been done before. But what I assume with good night books is that like You know, you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nights with your kids and they're going to be in different moods every night and they might need something slightly different to go to sleep every night. So, you know, it is a sort of glutted part of the industry, but I think it's sort of a necessary part of the industry. But then there's sort of a separate, you know, not so much good night books, but sort of sweet books. So I think of like, I love you forever or guess how much I love you. And that sort of very, you know, parent and child or grandparent and child meaningful moment books. Those are a a huge component of the industry. There's kind of funny books, which we would probably, you know, categorize as books that you wouldn't want to read before you go to bed because they're really kind of raucous and they get your kids kind of energized. And maybe there's an adventure or like kind of, you know, fantastical things happen in there. I mean, that's the crazy thing is like picture books are considered a genre. But what's true about them is that they actually comprise as many genres as any other art form. You know, there's there's not a picture book type of story. Every type of story is a picture book story. It just needs to be applied correctly to the form. That's really interesting. It's going to we're going to have a lot of times where I say in this conversation, "Duh, that makes sense." But <laughs> duh, it does make sense where it's kind of like before I had a kid or before I was really hanging around with very small children, I was like, "Well, this the artwork has to be good and I've got really good wordsmith ability, so this book is amazing." <laughs> But now it's like, well, I have nap time. I have bath time. I have, I'm tired of you watching television time. You all by yourself, little child picked up a book and want to read it. So I have to let you do that because that's important. (laughs) And then good night time. And it does seem like my son really likes the little blue truck series. Oh yeah. So there's different versions, different Stories about little issues, yeah, stories or different uh, the sequel, prequel, and and origin stories of Little Blue Truck. Uh, It's like okay, that does make sense that these books are not you don't have one book, right? You know, fortunately, we don't have one book for all (laughs) seasons. I think as a parent, you want the right book for the right moment at all of your moments, and so there's a lot of high drama or low drama moments in a kid's life. And ideally, you know, the picture books that get published address those types of moments in a kid's life. Um, but yeah, it, it, I mean, it should, it's just like, it's just like novels. Like sometimes when you, you know, a beach read is a certain type of mood and a mystery is a certain type of mood. And, and those are all different par- parts of your life. And kids have a lot of different, you know, parts of their life too, even though it feels from the adult's perspective, like they don't like, you know, as a dad, like there's, you know, tons of melodrama in one day, and there should be a book for each of those moments. And then a dinosaur book is all he wants to see for a week. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, how exactly. many dinosaur books do I possibly need? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we rely on you needing a lot of them. So exactly. <laughs> and it, it's, it's funny how, how, how often he'll like a dinosaur book. Really? Dinosaurs, construction, <laughs> trains. Uh, yep. It's like, you know, just very boy type things. That's so uh, funny. But then he does like Twinkle Twinkle. So I can't, uh, Twinkle awesome. Twinkle Star. I can't, we'll never stop that. Um, <laughs> but still staying in that author standpoint, um, yep. when an author comes to you and they're, they're, they've cornered you at a party and they're being very nice and very uh, open to critique and advice, what would you tell them to start thinking about? W- about their pitch and about their book. What are the things they mm-hmm. need to do before they really send in a manuscript that gets stuck in a pile for later? Yeah. The first thing I say to do is honestly the most fun step. The first thing that's really important for any aspiring author or illustrator to do is to go read as many 
picture books as they can get their hands on or whatever genre they're working in. They just need to immerse themselves in the field because they're coming into an industry where we all know like all the books that have been published in the last, you know, 10 years, especially maybe 20. And then there's obviously many, many more before that, that we all have kind of at our mental, you know, fingertips right the away. Classics so for sure. Yeah. The classics for sure. But like, the last 10 years are pretty well known to anybody you're going to be talking to. So if you're like, hey, I have a great idea for, you know, a book about a sloth, we can say, well, you know, that's great. But Sparky was is kind of the go to book about sloths right now. So maybe something else. And I think it's just good. You know, it's kind of like in any industry other than creative industries, you got to do a lot of work before you make your first attempt at being an, you know, a professional member of that industry. And it's only with something creative like, you know, illustration or or art overall or music that you can kind of, you know, because there are tons of success stories, you can kind of tell yourself, well, I'm really good at art, so this is going to be amazing the first time I try it. But the reality is, ideally, you really care about the art form as more than just a means to being published. And so when you set out to go be published, you want to know what that industry is actually made of. So the first thing I usually say to do is like, go sit down in a in a bookstore or a library and just read as many books as you can for hours and for multiple days and really look at what's working. The books that hit you really hard, why do they hit you so hard? So I know we're going to talk about page turns and sort of the design of the picture book a little bit, but the fun part about becoming part of this industry is not just reading to kids, which is also a really instructive part of learning how to write good picture books, but just looking at the books as a crit like critically as an art form because they really are. And so becoming sort of immersed in what's out there right now will not only show you what your competition is and what you're up against, so that if you think you have a great ABC dinosaur book, you'll see there are tons already that don't need your <laughs> inclusion. There's there's not many spins on that on that genre right no. now. No, no, no. And then there's, it's hard to get a new take on ABC dinosaurs. We haven't really found enough new dinosaurs to, <laughs> to do that. But right. the other thing you get is like you learn a lot about the form. So you'll become a better picture bookmaker even as you're educating yourself about what your competition is. That's a really key part. What are some of those bad book ideas that you hear a lot? And when I say bad, I mean bad for the time. They could have been good 20 years ago. In 20 years from now, they might be amazing. But what sure. are some of those – Obvious to you, but not obvious to a first timer, second, third timer that that you want to look at people and go, stop, just don't do this anymore. It, it's it's not going to happen. Right. I think. ABC books, alphabet books of any kind are really tricky to make work. There has been an ABC book for just about every concept and every. You know. Theme art form idea there's been an alphabet book for. So I, I would be really hard pressed to make me publish an alphabet book. I don't want to do that. And and then the ones, you know, they're just publishing, you're kind of publishing into a black hole there. So that I think a book that that was just a sweet good night book that didn't have anything new to necessarily contribute about going to sleep. I see a lot of those. Right now, I mean this is a good thing, but right now I'm seeing a lot of sort of empowering, you know, kind of nonfiction, empowering books, kind of in the model of like Goodnight Rebel Girls, sort of anthology series that are meant to inspire. And I think, you know, the motivation behind doing that is really wonderful, but to do it just out of a motivation to empower doesn't give you much of a very authentic or felt story. So some of those can feel like they're just trying to capitalize on on the moment rather than actually, you know, say something true. Do you get a lot of uh, pitches for somebody trying to create their own version of a character? Not even something of existing IP, but like I've yes. created the coolest character ever. Yes, You're gonna absolutely. Absolutely. And that happens. <laughs> that comes a lot from people in my experience who yeah, they either see sort of the franchise character as like, oh, I can think of a name, I can think of an animal, let's go make that character go to school and, and you know, have a sick day. And basically, <laughs> Berenstein bears it for, you know, whatever <laughs> right, their character right. is. <laughs> yeah. I'm really good at drawing foxes. So it's going to be go. fox goes yeah. to the store, fox changes attire. 
Exactly. And it's surprising, like, I'm sure you're having this experience as a dad. It's surprising how hard it is to make a character who basically just exists for issues to exist around. It's like Franklin the turtle is kind of just there to, like, you know, get kids to act out, going to school, being sick, having a birthday. Like, those are all kind of classic themes. And the character, you know, doesn't have much actual character other than just, like, his existence. But it's hard to actually make that. That's actually a really... Like Little Blue Truck, for example, like that's actually a really amazing. It has to you have to have a core of something real for that to work. It can't just be just a cute animal. I see a lot of um, stories that we'll talk about the slush pile, which which is where all the manuscripts without agents come for a publisher. And a lot of things we see in there come from mostly older people who have experimented with this story on their grandkids or their kids and there's a character that they might make up bedtime stories about i see so many characters about whom bedtime stories already exist and they're like my kids love this story and which is so awesome but the question always has to be your kids love the story your grandkids love the story but does it need to be published or is this just like a really sweet thing that you get to share with your family and that's sort of the answer is usually the latter in that circumstance. That comes into the money conversation, which we'll uh-huh. definitely talk about because that, sure. that's, that's a bigger one. So yeah. that's a little bit of the author. Mm-hmm. Now you as the editor, is it your job to find the illustrator or do you have people, illustrators coming to you to pitch going, hey, I can make beautiful art. Give me some words. How does it work from the visual side? So the illustrator component is one of my favorite parts of my job. That is, unless the person is author, illustrator, both, that is the job of the publisher. And generally, it's it comes down to, at least at Chronicle Books, it kind of has different iterations at different publishing houses. But at Chronicle, the decision is is between the editor and the designer of the book. And it's really important to us to make sure that the author is always you know, overjoyed with their choice of illustrator, too. So there are always, you know, nightmare stories of authors who got assigned some illustrator that they hate. We (laughs) never do that. (laughs) It's always it's always better to have everybody love the book because then everybody wants to promote the book and they want to go out and tour and talk about it. So that choosing an illustrator is one of the most fun jobs, parts of my job for sure, because, you know, and like you said, they can come from many different ways. So sometimes you know, there's definitely a list of illustrators I have just mentally and on my computer and in all kinds of places of illustrators I'm dying to work with. People I really want to sign up for books, but I'm waiting for, you know, just the right manuscript to pair with them. Or I'm waiting for their schedule to clear up because they're, you know, not taking on projects currently. Where do you personally find them? You know, the place I find them most is the same place I send everybody else. I'm watching books that come out. Most of my favorite illustrators, I see their work on another picture book and I think, oh my gosh, this captures, you know, this emotion so perfectly. Or look at these facial expressions. Like I've never seen somebody do that. So I'm, I, when I'm reading picture books now, like I'm constantly tracking the illustrator and, you know, and the author too, of course, looking at how those books work. But if it's an illustrator I really like, I sort of mentally put them on my list. So that's one way. Instagram is another great place to see people's work. It really is Instagram. I have been hearing oh, that yeah. more and more, and it's man, it's that social it's so media great. thing where we're like, does it really happen? Or but you're it's telling so me, yes. stupid, you know. But yes, it absolutely does. And one thing I love about Instagram too is even even people who I'm currently working with, you know, there's not this pressure. So most illustrators will have an Instagram and also a portfolio on their website. And the difference between their portfolio and their Instagram can sometimes be considerable. So that I'll go on their portfolio and say man, I don't know, this all looks like they'll they'll have been creative for a client or they'll be following some prompt or they'll be, you know, following a theme and you won't see a lot of inspiration. But then when you go over to their Instagram and you see their sketches or something that they just jotted down when they're on the subway, that's where you see their real artistic self um, really come out. So following people on Instagram is a great way to, to learn how they actually do art. You also might find, you know, some of the illustrators that I see in books and I think, nah, like they're not doing anything interesting. I don't need to, I don't, I won't put them on my mental list. I look at their Instagram and I say, like, or I see 
they actually can do portraits really well, but we don't, you know, you don't always know what their sort of publication history has been. They might have been art directed a very specific way for their entire publishing career. And what you get to see on Instagram or, you know, if they have sketches on their portfolio on their website, you get to see how they actually want to make art. So it's a really fun thing to find an illustrator who's been published in a really commercial generic way and say, hey, we want you to set yourself free and just do what you've been doing in basically your art books and do that for us because we really like your line. We don't like your, you know, more sort of commercial sensibility, mm -hmm. but we want you to go follow right. your instincts. We don't like, we yeah. don't particularly like that client that much either. Yeah. We get it. Yeah. You got to pay rent. However, totally. <laughs> yep. However well, that, we that's really actually like you. great yeah. to hear that you as somebody who's being part of this commissioning process. I mean, that that gives, you know, an old guy like me going, oh, well, maybe my work is still viable, where you're actually going out and searching it because I think that's the hard part, you know, just to mention the student body at, at this point. You know, so much of what you do is, you know, first five years of your career is what somebody paid you to do because you're too busy yeah. looking for work, not, I don't have time to be creative on my own. Absolutely, absolutely. And I know that can be, the the good thing is, you know, when when we're choosing an illustrator, we're scouring any work we can find of theirs really? that's online. Oh, yeah. Wow. So I would never sign somebody up because I saw one piece. Like okay. I if I'm if they're on my list at all, I've gone and looked at their whole whatever they whatever I can find. Um and so I know at that point, you know, I don't know their publishing history, but I can see that they have several different styles, maybe, or we might want to steer them in one direction. So it it's a pretty it's like a pretty holistic acquisition process. Wow, that's that's a lot of work for. <laughs> I mean, it's something. really fun work though. Too, yeah, sure. It is like you're basically matchmaking. You're trying to yeah. find art that matches the book, and and you know, especially like I'm working on a book right now that we just are finalizing the illustrator for, but it's a chapter book, so it's it's a little different than a picture book because it isn't the text does not rely on the illustrations. They are going to be decorative, and they should expand the story, but they're not going to contradict it in any way because that wouldn't serve the story. Um, but that was a really long illustrator process because we had lots of people who were all great but so different and and that's sort of something that you're deciding this early on is like well there's many different avenues any book can go down and and so you are you are sort of starting down a path as soon as you choose the illustrator even if you know that person has a wide range and you can direct them within that range but that's only one you know Instagram and known illustrators are one component. There are illustration agencies that only, like, you know, most agencies have, uh, you know, they have clients that are authors and illustrators, maybe poets, whatever. Um, but some illustration agencies are just there to basically do, you know, they're they're there to to take commission work. Um, and those are, I think, sometimes when you're first starting out as a student, you are often signing up with an illustration agency who can kind of rep you until you get a book deal. And then you might not be doing as many editorial projects, but you are maybe if, if your goal is to illustrate picture books, for for example, then you and, might be going over more. And there. is that illustrate those illustration agents, those seem relatively new? They are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, mean, well, I mean, well, I shouldn't say I that. School, with such it was not a thing. Yeah. I and, think in my experience, they are relatively new. Um, they, you know, there, there are, there's, there are, there's an agent for every creator. And I think as children's books has become such a lucrative industry, the agency field has sprung up around it. And so it's become clear that like having sort of a, a way station of, of illustrators is a great thing to do for an agent. And of course, agents take some commission from those projects too. Right, um, that's that weird I'm, I'm largely pro agent, by the way, <laughs> right, but you yeah. do need to know what you're getting into going sure. into it. Um, and, and the, the illustration agents, um, I think they're sort of, they can be like somewhat of a stepping stone for the artist. But I mean, I work with those agents often because there are different projects that have different needs. And if you need something, you know, if, if we're doing a, a set of playing cards and you just want illustrations, it, it isn't always going to be in your best interest as a publisher to go sign up somebody who's super expensive from a major agent. You are going to look for somebody who can kind of achieve what you're going for from an illustration agency. Um, and then the other last place I look is like I try to, you know, pre-COVID times, obviously, try to go to the art shows in the mm -hmm. city um, okay. and see new work um, from kids at CAA or, or whatever. Um, those are and our designers all go to those, too. Um, so that's like a totally valid place to show off work, too. So so it really is, you know, the illustrator has to be 
out there hustling every which way but loose to get yeah. seen. Yeah, I mean, there's no – it's so tempting, I think, probably to to just stick with your projects and sort of do, you know, whatever you're most inspired to do. But it's – if you just think about the, the amount of art that there is out there that any editor or designer is going to have to wade through anyway – you know, it's just a good idea to put yourself out there as much as possible. And the good that is like, you know, I hate to go back to Instagram, but that is the good thing about Instagram is it's very easy to just like throw up your pieces sure, once sure. a week or whatever. And just, you know, the more sort of connections you can make. I, I think the other cool thing about children's books is as frustrating as it can sometimes be is it is a very small world of an industry it's mm -hmm. it's like narrow but very deep so it's worth making those connections it's worth staying in touch with you know you're visiting speakers or whatever and and anyone you can meet in this world probably knows somebody else in this world it's a very okay. networked community um, and it's also like you know it's not no one is going to get rich off of being a children's book <laughs> editor. So you the cool thing about this job is that everybody, especially on the West Coast, like that's the cool thing about everyone being out here. It's not easy to find a job in publishing on the West Coast right. because most of it's all in the East Coast. It's most of it's in New York. Yeah. Yep. And and that's kind of the cool thing about the industry in this specific location, because everyone who's doing it is necessarily going to be super passionate about it because if there was an easier way to, or if there was a more lucrative way to, you know, be in the children's book industry, anybody would be doing it, but everybody just really wants to be here. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. For, that's good for us over here then. Um, yeah. <laughs> so now, now comes that part where you've got your writer, you've got your illustrator. Now you as an editor, what are, you know, what are you doing? What, what, what's your job at this point? Yeah. So now let's see. It's so funny because we work so far out in the future sure. that I any, mean, I mean, we're talking a year, two years, two years, three more. years. I mean, the books that I'm signing up right now will be coming out in fall 2023 and we're talking in, in October of 2020. <laughs> yeah. So because what you're, what you're sort of getting ready is you are finding an illustrator. Once you have an illustrator, um, you know, and while you're finding an illustrator, you're still editing the manuscript. So you're sort of doing two things at once. Um, you then, the illustrator is going to work on sketches. The illustrator might have several projects that they have to work on before they get to this project. Like many people are booked almost always. And so even if you find somebody who's like, great, I can make time for this. They're not just going to jump on it right away. Um, so that's sort of a waiting game. Um, as they are sketching, um, I'm looking at new acquisitions and, fi and finding those books. I'm editing those novels, for example. Um, and then books that are coming out now, I am sort of, you know, in, in a normal time, I'd be going to conferences and to librarian, you know, panels to talk about these books. We're pitching upcoming seasons. It's funny because like very few of my hours at the office are usually spent actually editing. Most of it is kind of managing titles and moving things from mm -hmm. one bucket to another bucket um, and keeping everything on track because the other job of an editor is just basically being the book's manager. Um, okay. okay. You're sort of responsible for, for everything in the book. So you're, and obviously, you're, not, you're not there correcting misspell, misspelled no, words. No, no, no. That, like, that's a very sort of end stage um, of the manuscript and it's a pretty small part of the job. Mm. Mostly the the editing, you know, the and, and that's kind of a, I'm glad you brought that up because it's a funny distinction of the job. The job of an editor is really to shape the story, to say, this character isn't coming through, or you think this joke is funny, but I'm not laughing, or mm. this line, when I read it aloud, I always trip up on this syllable. It's really about shaping the book. Right, right. It's that, not that makes, about, yeah. yeah. That makes yeah. a lot when of I was, sense. Yeah. When I was a kid, like, thinking of being an editor, I thought that all you did was, like, correct typos. And that's actually a copy editor's job. My job is really more a sort of big picture shaping um I mean, that's not to say it's not at the nitty gritty, but it's not. M my job is more subjective and a copy editor's job is objective. Mm, got it. Well, that that, yeah. that makes sense because I know that is a mystery term. I know there's a lot yeah. of terms. I mean, if you look at the film industry, a film editor is putting yes. things together, but they're really crafting a story. Totally. That's so funny that you bring. I was just going to bring film up because a film editor is really like that's a good thing for people to think of with an editor. It's it's the editor who's basically compiling the shots um, mm -hmm. of the book rather than, the, you know, the person going in to 
fix the continuity between the shots. That's yeah. sort of the copy editor's job. Yeah, it was, a lot of the illustrators we've talked to have said that's like, yeah, I'm making a movie in 48 frames. Yep. That's it. That's a yep. That's a really helpful way to think about it. And the, I I have found that. Um, you know, younger people who are really adept at making videos online have an innate sense of how picture books work because you are, yeah, you are kind of compiling, you know, you're going between your zoomed out shots and zooming in and panning in on a face. And so sure. those things can really help the way you construct. And a lot of our, you know, best um, or at least most well-known illustrators have some experience in animation at some point. You know, John Clausen is a big name. Mm -hmm. um, he spent his time illustrating, I mean, animating. And yeah, a lot. that's like a really helpful sort of um, subtextual well, skill and to you, have. And it's interesting when you see these videos, the, read, the, the books read aloud on YouTube, it's like three and a half minutes. It's like, yeah, that's a, you, you got to do a lot in three and a half minutes. That's, yeah, when, you know, totally. it's, it's totally. a huge amount of time. I mean, even when I read a, a story to my kid, it's like, it was five minutes, buddy. How come you're not asleep? I mean, yeah, that, that's totally. what the goal was, buddy. Go to sleep. Now. I know. <laughs> I know. And if you and that's kind of a funny like, you know, part of the illustrator's job is to think about how much time you want your reader to be spending on each of those pages. Mm. One of the things I'm sure you found in just like the older books we were talking about um, they used to be, I mean, this is totally generalizing, but older books used to have a lot more words per page and, sure. and more word, higher word count overall. Um, that Fancier was something words that, too. A little a yeah. higher, a higher level of English for sure. Yeah. Which, I mean, doesn't speak so highly of our educational system <laughs> because when you figure it's the parents reading either way. Right. A lot um, of multisyllabic words. Yeah, totally. But one thing that I find really hard when I'm reading aloud to kids is when you have a spread, so you're kind of showing off your book um, and you have the book open with a spread and it's just a big old text block that takes up, you know, a full minute to read out loud. And the kid reading that you're reading to has one thing to look at. That can be a really challenging situation for a parent or a teacher to read in. So we think a lot about how much time you're spending with that book open in front of a kid on each page. I did a book a couple years ago that was 112 pages um, for, it was a picture book um, and it was for, you know, ages four to eight. But what we were really careful to do, it was called Her Right Foot and it was written by Dave Eggers, illustrated by Sean Harris. And we were really careful to have basically one sentence per spread so that even though it's 112 pages, it reads really quickly. Mm, and there's right. something new to look at almost every, you know, 10 to 15 seconds or so. Um, and that's just like it's thinking about your audience um, and how the book, again, like actually functions as an object is so crucial. And that that's is that all your decision or do you hope that the, the, the idea of page turns, the idea of how this book will function? Is that your sole responsibility or is that as a, a writer and illustrator are advancing in the industry, they're starting to learn that? Or is that your constant cross to bear? <laughs> that is, you know, it is everyone who works on the book's job. Um, okay. And when you work with somebody who who knows how to put a book together, it's amazing because they know the pacing. They know exactly. To take that same book as an example, Sean Harris, who illustrated it, his sketches, his change from the sketches to the final art, there were, I think, three minute changes in 112 pages because he had such an excellent sense of exactly how the book was supposed to be paced and exactly where your reading, how you, how your read aloud would work, how the emotions should build across the book. And when you work with somebody who has an innate sense like that, it's like, I mean, it is just so life-changing. But aside from those genius people, there's no perfect science to picture books. That's what one thing that I really love about them. Um, and so when I'm reading it, I am looking for how is this pacing working? How does this page turn function? Where are my eyes going when I land on this page? Are they accidentally going to the second sentence that you're supposed to read? Those are mm, things that I look at constantly. But there are also things that the designer is looking at, that the copy editor is looking at. Everyone who reads it in the make team, what we call it, mm -hmm. um, the author too. Like if the author and il illustrator are separate, sometimes they'll say like, hey, you know, I'm really having a hard time reading this font, for example, I, I don't like, it doesn't support the tone of the book. Everyone right. who's reading it is coming to it from their own sort of level of expertise. Um, and everybody's relevant because a good picture book should be able to be read by anybody. I'm the editor, but, but I don't know 
how it's going to work with a classroom of kids, for example. So anyone in the sort of creative process of the book is going to be reading it critically, um, bringing to it their own perspective. And all of those people are equally key. It, okay. it, in an ideal world, like every book <laughs> would be able to be read out loud to like 30 test classes of kids. Like that would be so awesome if I could figure out how to do that. Because <laughs> because like we also in the industry, you know, you get so you hear a lot like, Kids hate this, girls like that, boys right. hate this, which is yeah. so, like, it's absurd because kids are as different as adults are. <laughs> okay. It's also the parents are tired of it. I, there's yeah. books I hate. I'm like, I am, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not throwing a book away because that's sacrilegious, <laughs> but I'm giving this book away very quickly. Yeah, uh, And totally. then there's some books that I'm like, if you love this book, buddy, I will read it to you because it, it makes you happy. I mean, a perfect example, I think, is... Um, uh, Eric Carl's Very Hungry Caterpillar. Very Hungry Caterpillar. Yeah. And it's like, you look at it from an art perspective, like, all right, it's a very good design. I get it. <laughs> you, you did something very special. And then as you do read it, you're like, we've got through a pace. There's a lot of interaction. Now we've got an ending and you're done. Wow. You really <laughs> pulled that off. I, I could not make my version of that without right. totally screwing it up. And, 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 right. That's a big thing. What's funny about about some of those classic books um, is I think some people, Eric Carle is a great example. Margot Wise Brown, who does Goodnight Moon, is another great example. Taro Gomi, I don't know if you guys have those books. Um, he's a Japanese author illustrator. Mm -hmm. He does a book called Spring is Here. He does a book called Bus Stops, My Friends. Um, he did the book Everyone Poops. Um, oh, okay. okay. He, like, I put those people in a category of being on some level of understanding what a kid needs that goes beyond what we're able to sort of comprehend <laughs> as parents or as creators. But when you read them with a the kid, they work. And you might read them yeah. as an adult and see, like, what is going on here? Like, it doesn't make any sense, or this isn't effective, or it's too short, or what happens? Why am but I then paying when you read... for this book? Sure, Why? exactly. Yes, exactly. But then when you read them with a the kid and they and they work... It's sort of this miraculous thing, you know? <laughs> Best it's like 95 this, I ever spent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's sort of the like the idea that like philosophers are children too because they're able to get at the, you know, children and philosophers are able to get at the sort of same level of simplicity uh -huh. and understanding of the universe. There's some degree of that in in picture book creators too, I think. The ones that have really lasted through the through the many decades that they've been published. There's something more to them than just like oh, it's popular, so we'll keep buying it. Hey, everybody. I'm going to jump in here around the midpoint and just give you a break, a chance to pause and take a minute and digest everything that Taylor is telling you. And, of course, let you know that if you are interested in finding out more about an art education, please RSVP today at academyart.edu slash podcast to learn more about our upcoming interactive online open house where we have over 40 plus areas of art and design programs, admissions information, financial aid information, campus life, and more. So here we are back to Taylor and the world of children's books. Like everybody, I got a box of books from somebody and they were probably remainder <laughs> books or books from an old library sale or something like that. And, um, you know, one book called Tuesday from the, from 1991 is beautiful. It's yep. gorgeous. Another book, not so nice. Yep. Not really interesting. I don't. I would not buy it. I wouldn't have bought it in, in 1985. <laughs> I don't think I would buy it now. Um, but that comes up to this concept of uh, art is good, writing is good, and we're making kids feel happy. But I really have rent to pay, and I want to make a lot of money. And this is a company, and I got to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. What does a book deal look like from the writer illustrator perspective, and what does that deal encompass? But, yeah. you know, when we think about, you know, everybody's heard Harry Potter and we're talking millions upon billions of dollars. Sure. Um, when I was doing research on this, um, we're now hearing authors' manuscripts going to auction, which in mm -hmm. my mind means lots of dollar signs when I hear yeah. auctions. 20 years ago when I was in school and people were talking about this, it was like, you know, you know work for hire, 200 bucks a page right. if you're lucky. Right. You know, you bang it out in a couple <laughs> weeks, you move on. <laughs> Now it's editorial, and then yeah. the word, word that that 
the changing of the letters, it seems only from editorial to published, is like, what just happened? Huge. Yes. What's going Huge. on? How yes. does that money change? Sure. So, I mean, and there's there's kind of little examples on both sides where you'll hear about somebody who only got paid, who's worked for hire, basically, and then the book made a ton of money, but they didn't see any of it because they just got paid a flat fee, which is sort of a nightmare from an illustrator's perspective. But... At the same time, I think the hope in doing work for hire illustration is that you get seen, you get attached to something huge, and it takes off. Like, that's kind of the, the gamble that you're making. Um, so there's so many different, you know, types of deal structures and expectations attached to advances um, in children's books. And it can be anything from, you know, you know, we have some projects that are work for hire authors, too, if you just want to sort of attach a text to something mm -hmm. um but yeah I you think, mentioned like you know playing cards and that that seems yeah, very much like a work for hire total, thing, absolutely. which makes total sense or so, and yeah exactly and sometimes like with something like that we might even give a couple hundred dollars to whoever the editor is in-house if they're spending their own time on it you know if they're like the author um but in general i think you can trace back the sort of huge advances that we now see regularly in children's books i think you can trace that back to Harry Potter because Harry Potter was something that really redefined what would be accomplished or could be accomplished by a children's book. It revitalized the industry. It turned it into this thing that was like, oh my gosh, there's so much money to be made here, you know, not just for JK Rowling, but for the entire enterprise. There's movies, there's, you know, and, and, and that was a whole new part of the industry when it started. There was not such thing as a midnight book release party before Harry Potter existed, <laughs> you know? And now right. that's something that happens for Wimpy Kid. It's something that happens for Dog Man. Like, that is a... It, it's sort of a, a reliable part of the industry now, but that all comes from Harry Potter. Um, and what also happened with that was this sort of a realization from everyone, every perspective of the industry, agents, authors, editors, publishing houses... Everybody was sort of like, oh, my God, there's so much money to be made here. You know, we want to have the next Harry Potter. And you did see a few years after that where there were more series that had a sort of similar level of, like, intense fervor. So there's series of unfortunate events. There was Twilight, Hunger Games. These were all as different as they are from Harry Potter. They followed the same model of this, like, you know, rabid this is not of cinematic excitement. enough. And I don't see a 16 episode television right. show out of this. So right. fix it. Right, right. But also just this sort of idea that that like you could get kids this excited about books, which was like, holy shit, we got to yeah, do this. I, for, shocking. You know, yeah. Shocking uh, yeah. and really shocking. cool. Like, yeah. really cool. And, and, and like something that I think is still like a really cool part of the industry. Um, yeah, because I'm trying to think like, I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, like no, when, no, no. when you, we talked about this and yeah. I've got two nephews that are big into it and they've got first editions and, and, you know, it's easy for the, to, you know, Christmas time's like, uh, go find some expensive Harry Potter thing and get it on sale. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm like, Something I was trying bound. To th right. Uh, but I was trying <laughs> to think like when I was, a, when I was a kid, I'm 42, like what was, what were those books? I mean, choose your own adventures were something yeah. that fifth grade through junior high was our you know literary crack yeah that's it the I thing so like anything. when i was a kid i was super into babysitters club right. and there okay. were i think around 150 sweet of valley those high. sweet valley high was like a little a little before my time so like <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> a little advanced for me sorry i have to get my um, crutches i i in my locker <laughs> so i apologize no yeah i mean like animorphs goosebumps like there yeah, were goosebumps, series yeah. but i think what you're getting at is that before harry potter Books were, you know, popular books were tailored more to the individual reader. And Harry Potter was for everyone. So Harry Potter was this democratizing moment. And it continues. Like, that's what's kind of, it's like the Eric Carl books. Like, it continues to be this thing that, despite now they've been out for 20 years or so, they continue to be this thing that, like, unites everybody. And there are, you know, the series, some of the series that followed in their wake continue to do that. But I think one of the, th the magical things, so to speak, about Harry Potter is, like, it was before kids were on the Internet so much. Um, and obviously we we're still, like, somewhat on the Internet, but there wasn't social media for kids in the way that there is now. And since that, since social media has risen, um, especially for kids, it's been, you know, it's the same as has happened in the culture overall. Like, it's harder to find the uniting chap chapter book or or YA book that, that like, comprises or that 
captures all audiences in the way that something like Harry Potter or Hunger Games did at the time, because everybody's attention is just more, you know, it's diverted to many different directions and they are more driven to things that are their specific thing again. It's sort of like we had this weird moment um, post, you know, Encyclopedia Brown babysitter club time where everything was sort of just for the kid themselves. We had this moment where we all were united in liking certain books, not every book, but certain books. And now we're sort of back to like, there's a book for every reader and you are just going to find the niche examples of what you like to read. I think children's books are solid because we will always have new kids. We always need to buy them new books. So that's just, it's, it's a really reliable part of the industry. <laughs> and and it's, it's funny you say buy, because this is, this is something that as a parent, oh God, <laughs> when you go start to buy, I mean, I got to yeah. pay you money. It becomes a very strange world oh, yeah yeah um i mean i i have worked i i had a couple of books published uh i were i worked lived overseas uh, i was hired because i was an english speaker and i think my mom me and the editor read those books and they were worth <laughs> the hire and that is where oh. my the quality of my writing has ended um <laughs> and who, who buys these books I mean, yeah. if you're trying to run a business or, you know, where your deal comes in, where your payment as the artist and the, and the, and the author comes in, um, since everybody's mm -hmm. got to make money, who's actually buying books? We can't, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's not, if it's not on Amazon, it's not at Costco and Walmart, you're screwed or is right. it? Right. One of the funny things about children's books as, as like who buys them, because obviously when you're a parent, part of what you're apprehensive about when you're spending basically $20 on a brand new book is like you might get it home your kid reads it once and doesn't like it and then that's it you know and of course there are the ones that they read over and over again or they may maybe they'll discover it later and there's always hope but you are hoping that it becomes sort of this intrinsic part of your household routine that's a big gamble to put $20 on really like especially if you have an opinionated kid or a kid with specific likes like you know Kids have tons of opinions, and they're not going to just sit there or and read it with you. Or you've got one kid, and you're a little older, and you're spoiling the garbage out of him. And you're like, yep. you should have a book every week, little guy. Oh, my God. That's what you're yes. supposed to do. I right, want you to right. be a, a well-rounded individual. Here's another book. Read right. it. Read it. Right. <laughs> right. I spent $20. Yeah, you don't want to be you don't want to be pressuring your kid to read books uh, that they don't want to read. So one of the things that is a huge um, component of the industry, because you also look at the bestseller list, and you're like, how in God's name is... Good night, good night construction site still on the bestseller list after, you know, over 10 years on there or maybe, okay, we're coming up on 10 years, but like, so where are the, it's not the same parents buying those over and over again. What happens and what's a really important part of the money that we count on for all these books are books as gifts. Any kind, any parent who is giving a friend's kid a gift, any grandparent who's giving their kids a gift, anyone going to a baby shower, these are all moments, like books are a really useful gift to give. And so the sort of books bought for somebody else is a big part of how the money gets spent on these books. And that's why you look at something like Good Night, Good Night, Search Site, and you're like, well, great. Everybody, their kid loved it. Your kid loves it. You bought it for your three friends, all of whom had boys in the same year. And that's sort of a really checkmark, easy gift to give. Um, because the other cool thing about books as a as a gift is like they're they're nice. You know, they are twenty dollars and they look beautiful as objects and they are they come with the value of like you know this test of time and reading it together so they aren't you know it's not $20 gift card it's a $20 thoughtful thing that you're giving to somebody um, and yeah we definitely rely on that we talk a lot about books that are like great baby shower gifts um, for those but, sort but of super the, sweet books <laughs> is there the <laughs> other side though of you know I mean, do I mean, do you give them to libraries? I mean, where do book because you mentioned library oh librarians before? Like, yeah. this seems. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, when I was a kid, you you went to the library and you got yeah. free, free. You could check out a book forever, and you know, again, one hundred one hundred and ten percent support to libraries and teachers. Give yeah. them more money, tax me, I'll Always. pay it. It's fine. Yeah. Um, yep. Book fairs, which is a mm -hmm. totally different business yep. model, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, but do those are when you're doing a print run of yeah. you know, the bo books you have coming out, what is your print run? Yep. To, to, to give so us numbers in there. Libraries. I mean, gosh, if you want to find the sort of secret weapon of of the book industry and really like the country overall, it's librarians. So we count so much on 
for for specific books, I mean, a book that does really, really well is a book that is bought by libraries for all of their collections. Let's even take the San Francisco Public Library. Last year, awarded the best public library system in the country, an amazing public library system, just a model of excellence in every single way. They are amazing. Okay. Um, but so they there's like around 20 branches, I think, of the San Francisco Public Library. Each of those branches is going to have, you know, one to five copies of okay. books that will okay. be checked out there. Okay. So that and, and, you know, someone's buying for the system and then those are being allocated to different branches. And then, of okay. course, you can check out from different branches and you return sure. to different branches and all that. Yeah. So that's one component of it. One thing that's really key to... But just, just to do the math. <laughs> so a a, a one, li- one city library could conceivably get by 100 to 200. Absolutely. As you're saying, and you're going to explain, yeah. I'm, I'm sure if I do a really good job and I sell to 50, yeah, that's a lot of books. That's a ton of books. Okay. And what Got you it. what okay. you're hoping for, you're sort of also hoping for like the ripple effect of those so that people who read them are also going out. Oh, my gosh, this was so great. Let's buy this for ourselves. Let's buy this as a gift. You know, those are all sort of ripples. But so the sort of the amazing thing about libraries is that they librarians are the ones behind all of the awards that, you know, structure most of the industry. There are a couple awards that aren't awarded by librarians, but anything from the ALA, the American Library Association, those are all awarded by librarians. And the all of those committees, they change every single year. And it's a huge honor for librarians to be on those committees, as you can imagine, because they might be the ones who choose Tuesday by David Weisner. Or they might be the ones that chose that one from 1985 that you don't really like. Any of those awards are selected by the librarians from that committee from this year. And what happens after a book wins one of those awards is that libraries all over the country are watching when those awards are published and they buy all those books for their collections because it's the same ripple effect. They know that parents are going to come in and see the sticker on the book and say, oh, we got to check this out. And they know that, you know, that teachers are doing the same thing. So for school libraries, same thing. They always want to have all the award winners. So when your book wins an award, it's typically considered a sort of an automatic. If it wins the Caldecott, it's co- like we count on it selling 100,000 copies. In that <laughs> it's, it's so funny. The cynical part of me is melting as you explain this, because I'm, yeah. as I as, as a parent, I'm going in and other parents have done this. Like you go look at at preschools and elementary schools and you take the tour and you want to yep. see the library because I want Johnny and Susie to be really, really smart. And if they got a bunch of old, sad, tired looking books without any of those little gold foil stamps. Yep. on it, This is yep. a really turd box school. And I am not going totally. to get in here and write totally. a check. So that, yep. that, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So those awards are huge. And then the other way that like we count on library sales is this is sort of like, I love when this happens because for a lot of times it's, it's voted on by kids. So state lists are also a really huge way for books to not only get successful, but stay successful for many years. But schools and states will, most of them have, most states in this country have a state award. Um, that they give to a chosen selection of books. Usually they give it to more than one book, not just not just one. Um, and what's cool about those books is that they are generally voted on by kids. So kids will do like, you know, they'll read, they'll have to read 10 books and they get to vote if they read all 10 books. Um, or there will be a sort of school wide vote. And the winners of those books will go on to this list that is statewide. And every teacher or every parent of a fifth grader gets the fifth grade reading list. And so libraries know that those books will be highly checked out because kids will be reading books off of those lists because a lot of teachers will do assignments based on them or they'll choose a book report. You got to do, you know, six throughout the year and they all have to be from this list. It's a guaranteed, you know, readership basically for those books. So I love those books. And a lot of like Chronicle's greatest successes have been books that just like get on a state list and go from there. So once it's on one state list, like other librarians see that it's on a state list and then it's sort of, you know, again, another ripple effect. Yeah, Yeah. quality does rise to the top. It does. It absolutely does. And especially like what's cool, like I keep saying about about those lists is like there's something inherently that kids are responding to in those books. So again, like those are major collection buys. Anything from those lists, you know, the Texas Texas library system is gigantic. Sure, um, that makes sense. You know, as you can imagine. And so anything that makes it onto any of the Texas state lists for any of the age levels, we can count on a pretty great buy from from those, you know, surrounding library systems. Okay. So that so it, it really comes down to 
if, if you know if your book is good, it, it's your job as the publisher to go. Okay, we have to evangelize this book exactly, and get this exactly to people and really make sure. So, how does that um, come into play when we're talking about that deal that the author and illustrator gets, or is that the cost that the publisher? Uh, assumes. I mean, there there's many things right. we hear about. There, you know, it's like, well, you know, all those green M and M's we charged you for. <laughs> they came out of your right. deal. Right. So a typical publishing deal is structured an advance against royalties, um, which is like it is. It can be similar to the music industry, but basically what that means is an author is paid up front, and that gives them the payment basically to go write this book. Um, and there's, you know, there's a gigantic spectrum of what a typical advance is depending on the, the author's, you know, whether they're at the beginning of their career, whether they've had bestsellers before, whether this is a competitive situation with other publishing houses, huge spectrum of advance levels. Um, but basically what that means is until the book earns that amount of money, the author doesn't see any more money, basically. So the, the publisher says, like, we think it's going to make this much. And if it exceeds that expectation, you're going to get royalties. If it doesn't exceed that expectation, we eat the cost. So it's sort of a gamble. Um, it. It's a gamble okay. from the beginning. Okay. And the goal, the goal is always to get to royalties because everybody benefits if we get right. to royalties. Right. The right. author gets more money, and we it means we're making more money than yeah. we put into the book, which is like ideal. Um, and as far as you know, the size of those, yeah, they can vary widely from from from. Uh, very low advances to very high advances and some degree of expectation of the book's performance is included in that initial advance. You know, if if we think it's going to sell, <laughs> it's so funny because it does become somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy or it can. So if we say this is going to be our major fall 23 lead, we think it's going to sell 100,000 copies. So we're going to pay you even though it's a competitive situation, we're going to pay you and we're going to be the winning publisher because we think we can make money off of this. Then it's on us to make good on that. You can't just plop a book out there and it, you know, you know, of course, there are always exceptions to every rule. But in general, you got to support it with marketing. You have to support it with co-op. So you're paying to have it rise to the top of whatever the Amazon page is or to have it associated with another construction book so that when people go to buy that, they see ours too. You know, those are all upfront costs. Shelf, you know, that, old school things like shelf space and expos absolutely, and things like that. Oh, absolutely. Wow. Although that okay. is changing a little bit with the new guy at BNN, which is great. Um, we, we want, we want indiv individual independent bookstores to have as much say and as much um, of the industry as we possibly can because that's where really like that's where we survive. So, yes, there is a degree of expectation in the advance, but there are just as many major advances that, that the author never earns back because for whatever reason it didn't meet with our expectations or tiny advances that were like, wow, we got, you know, we thought this was fair. It turns out the book majorly overperformed our expectations. And so the author sees royalties almost right away and, and everybody's happy. Right. And, and you, know, we're, you know, you're at Chronicle. So Chronicle is more of a niche publisher would you say mm -hmm. or more a, a smaller press i mean it's yeah. not i mean you know because we're, we're not talking Har harper collins and i do want to ask sure. you about like scholastic and yeah what looks like you know you're we, we've been talking about very well thought out beautiful <laughs> books caldecott winning books and newberry award and then there's the six staple bound books for 5.99 i get at walmart that right. yeah they're books here's your books I got to go. Yep. Yeah, there's definitely different models. Chronicle is an independent publishing house. So that means that basically we are not owned by any shareholders. We are owned by a person, um, the McAvoy Group. Um, and the McAvoy Group owns a few other publishers too. But what that means is, you know, unlike what's called the big five. So that's like Harper, Penguin, any of the, any basically any of the publishers most people can name. Sure. Those are the big five. <laughs> okay. um, and unlike them, we are not beholden to anything other than basically our own bottom line. We want basically books that make people see things differently, whether that means makes them think about things differently, it makes them re-understand what a book can look like, um, or, you know, it it features a voice that has never been heard from before. So that means it's very vague and and multi I, don't, no, I actually don't, I think I don't think that's vague. I think it's not vague to me now anymore as a parent okay. because okay. it's it's interesting like, you know, 
I had, before we talked, we had gone to a friend's house who has a nine-year-old and she was like, here, here are some books, here are some toys, here are some clothes, get them out of my garage, you have a kid now, I don't want them anymore. <laughs> and you're like, great, I will take them because it's free because this stuff is expensive and got mm -hmm. two big boxes of books and I went through the books and most of them were, dare I say, not worth the paper they were printed mm -hmm. on. They were not, mm -hmm. or they were books that I, I, I've never bought, I've, I've seen them in a store and I never would buy them and... You know, I'm not going to name publishers because maybe yeah. they'll give me a job one day. But they are like <laughs> compilation books. Um, yeah. A lot of like, here's 10 dinosaur books. Here's 15 books on transportation around the world. Simple books. Books that kids like. Books that are good. You know, you want your kid to have books. It You know, a $10 investment is fabulous and you should do that. Then yeah. there were books that I had dug out with it where you talked about like yeah. Tuesday and If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. Uh -huh. um, I mean, great classic books that I yeah. didn't even know were in there. And right. it was like, but on a business side, from an illustrator, an artist, an editor, a publisher, I must have got 50 books that I didn't pay for. Right. Right. How does that fit into the business model or is that just part of how this industry works. Yeah. I mean, that is part of how this industry works. Like that is, and I think that's true, you know, whether you're talking about children's books or whether you're talking about novels. Like I do think the rise of little free libraries has shown us that there are, <laughs> you know, a whole cast of books that like nobody wants to keep, but everybody read and you see them like everywhere, you know? And I think that's like, that is sort of, you know, that's you mean like the Dan fate. Brown. I mean, Dan Brown, like yeah, somebody like yeah. Dan Brown. <laughs> somebody like Dan Brown. Exactly. I see a lot of John Grisham, a lot right. of, a lot, a lot of Eat, lot Pray, of, Love. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think I have a table that's being yeah. leveled out by a Dan Brown and John Grisham book that I almost read. Oh my <laughs> Nothing against John exactly. Grisham. I love his books. Exactly. No, totally. Dan Brown can stay but on like, the table. They're not books maybe that you want to own forever, um, and they're maybe yeah. not books that were super meaningful to you. I think one thing that Chronicle values over other things is, you know, we we cherish our independence. We don't want to be a big five, and we would never, like, we. I think it would be a long time before we would concede to being bought by another house. And so we know that we're never going to have the corner on the market for, um, you know, cheapness, Um we don't want to have bad paper quality, even if it costs less. So like our values in the books that we make are are sort of what we think of as being our strength. And I will say, like, I, I can honestly say there's not a book on our list that I can think of that is not considered in every way. So that even if it's a book that's meant to be sold at the cash wrap at Urban Outfitters, it is a book that we genuinely think is funny and will delight people and will make people happier or better or, you know, or it's important for some reason. Like there's nothing, there's no trash on our list. And like, I don't, there's nothing like that is meant to just like make money for money's sake. Everything that we see as a money making opportunity has some other value attached to it, whether that is, you know, humor or importance or, um, a, a really special illustrator that we want to publish, you know, for the first time. Um, and that's something that we get to decide because we're independent. And I, you know, I've never worked in one of the big five, so I don't know what that's like. But because we're not beholden to anyone other than ourselves, um, it, it it is a unique. And it, I think it does come back to everybody being on the West Coast and being really passionate about publishing. Like, I don't think that's I don't think it's a coincidence that we happen to be an independent house and we're also in a place where there aren't any other publishers. Hmm. So that, that kind of brings up, you know, two big, somewhat separate questions that I, I, I want to kind of wrap this up with. Mm -hmm. um, what is your opinion on self-publishing, create space, uh, <laughs> um, the audibling of the world, all of which I have been a part of. Many people yeah. are a part of. There are yeah. some great, st I mean, you know, you can't say audible without somebody going, but Neil Gaiman. Oh, God. Um, I, know. I know. And but then if you actually go and seek out this work as an as somebody who is a creative trying to get work to work within this, you see a lot of self-publishing stuff. It's like you ain't Joseph Conrad. Stop. Right. Right. Please don't right. write anymore. Stop. Throw your computer yeah. away. Yep. I okay, think it's really that so, bad. <laughs> it's not well, just me no, being an a-hole. <laughs> you you are you can feel good about being an a-hole in this <laughs> In this situation, Yay, finally. What, yeah, yeah, I give you permission. So one thing like I will say is that I think the question around self-publishing, like 
the motivation behind it to me is usually really clear, but I think it comes from a place of really wanting to be published. Mm -hmm. And that motivation has many different, you know, emotions. Because I mean, we've all, so whether, when you do this, there's plenty of people you find out that it's a vanity press and you're like, ew. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's like, it's a, it's such a frustrating industry because there are so many success stories from people who did it for the first time and it worked mm -hmm. or people who, you know, tried it for many, many years and then finally they got picked up. And so there's every single reality that you can attach your own reality to and say, well, I'm just that guy. Like there's me right there. I think what is really important to consider if you are thinking about going the self-publishing route is what is your goal in publishing this book? Is it just having a physical copy of something that you're really proud of? Because if that's the case, awesome. Self-publish. Go for it. You know, give it to your friends, you know, design it yourself. Be proud of it from top to bottom. Great. But if your goal is to prove to somebody that you should be published, then self-publishing is not the right answer for you. Okay. Because what the worst thing that you could do is publish something awesome and then <laughs> it's been self-published and no one will buy it. Like right. we had I, I have had a, a situation where the book was really, really good. I wanted to publish it. But because it had already been self-published, it sort of had cannibalized itself before I could even do anything about it. Oh, wow. It. And that's kind of the that's like what you don't want. To well, no, that's happen. that's that's something. I mean, that you know, you're, that's something to really hold, hold yeah. true and go. Wait a second, it, you know, if you're that good, you should be found. You should get off your butt and pitch. But yeah. if you get something that's really good and somebody's put it out and have oh they, man, have they murdered? It's devastating. It? Oh, I wow. think I don't think they've murdered it, but it's like a huge asterisk next to it if you oh, get wow. it as an editor. Like I remember the I remember <laughs> being so excited about this book, and I remember the moment when the the agent was like, and just so you know, he did self-publish this. And I was immediately like, oh, well, next book then, you know, I'll, mm. I'll work with this guy on something else because it just, it's just an uncertain thing. And, you know, it, part of it comes from, especially because we're in an independent house, we are, we really stand by every dollar that we spend on a book. Okay. Um, and it, so that means that we're really, um, we care a lot about the track record of an author or of a book. And if if there's basically data saying this book sold 200 copies as a book and, and my finance people come to me and say, you want to put this out as a book and <laughs> it's been proven to only sell 200 copies. What are you talking about? And so right. it's just then it comes down to me being passionate and saying like, but no, it didn't have a right publishing plan and it doesn't have, you know, a design behind it, but that doesn't, that's not data. That's like, again, me as a that's subjective That's a lot reader. of emotion that yes, doesn't always exactly. play out. Okay. Passion doesn't, all, pa passion, in my experience, can't always mean dollars. It can, but mm -hmm. like, but to have, <laughs> do you have a sort of weight that you're pulling against as a, as a self-published book is just, it, it, cannot help you. So that's why I say like decide what you want for your book beforehand because if your point is to prove people wrong and say I am a published author, I don't think that self-publishing is going to be the answer for you. Yeah, yeah, there's plenty of vanity presses that'll, yes. that'll do that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, and that makes sense. I mean, you know, as 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 we we like to be highfalutin and talk about very intelligent things, it does come down to, you know, a paycheck. Yeah. I mean, this is, and I mean, this like, is a business. Uh, it is a business. I know. And it's like it can be even from somebody for me in the business, it can it's very hard sometimes to separate the part of me that responds to something as a reader and the part of me that responds to something as an editor. And that those two parts of myself, like I need to be careful about distinguishing those, because if you're not, you're just you're making foolish bets. And the reason that matters, the reason that like I am able to think somewhat clinically about the books that I work on is because I think about my authors. And the worst thing you want to do is give somebody an advance that that's their flat fee for the year and they don't ever make any money again. Mm -hmm. Like I want them to dine out on this book for the rest of their lives. That's the goal. Yeah. You want them yeah. to keep making money forever and ever. And if you, you know, if you think about like even a high advance, let's say you pay $75,000 for a novel. That's a lot of money, but that's sure. like, that's a year's salary and that's about it. You know, like, yeah. especially yeah. if this person is like, you know, has a family to support. Yeah. It's not like a, a big advance doesn't always, it's after taxes, it's only after paycheck rent, to pay. after yeah. everything. It's, it's, Absolutely. it's a good corporate job for a year if you're lucky. And exactly. You're and, and then you're done. And then you got to make the next book and you got to hope that it's sold, you know, that you can sell it for the same level as before. So my goal is always to get people earning royalties because it just 
it's then an actual thing they can count on. Um, so that's sort of how I think about like the payment part of things and okay. why it's a goal to be successful financially and not just make these beautiful objects that sell 50 copies. Okay. Well, that, that kind of brings up that last question where I'm not going to pitch you my story. I promise. <laughs> but for people who, you know, want to do books, there's a million stories out there. All of them are good. I'm sure at some point, but for you as, as an, as you, as the editor, what are you looking for and what is the story that you hope to get? What is it you want to be publishing? What are the trends that you're seeing that go, all right, this, this is what my job entails. This is the story mm -hmm. I want. Mm -hmm. You know, every time it's funny because that's something that agents ask a lot is like, what are you looking for right now? And because we're not a big five house, I don't have specific topics or things that I like really that like if it's that I say yes but what I respond to most are things that are very specifically authentically true to the writer so anybody who sets out to write a book for x for x emotion for x holiday for x situation that's not as interesting to me as somebody who just tells this story that comes through them as like a human um, and I also think that's especially true with kids books because, you know, books that are written with a purpose always wear that purpose on their sleeve. And I'm not really interested in books that are motivated only by a purpose. I'm interested in books that have a purpose because they're authentic and they tell a true story that a kid will respond to. Only specific kids respond to those type of books. But a book that inspires them because there's a kick-ass hero heroine at the center of it or a book that inspires them because for the first time they're seeing something that they feel that they've never seen named before they're seeing that in the book that is a book that can change a kid's life and it comes from a sense of authenticity and honesty and truth I think like that's what makes for a really good book so if it doesn't have those things if it is just written for um, a moment um, or for kids in general that's that's where I lose interest. What, what are some of those books that you're really proud of that you brought that you brought to the market? Oh my gosh. One of my favorite books I ever worked on was this book called 100%. Um, it's by Karen Romano Young. It came out in 2016. Um, and it's about a girl named Tink. It's her last year of elementary school, which in her school system is sixth grade. Um, and that book captured for me what it felt like to be 12 and to have all these conflicting um feelings and situations and sort of these moments that were at, at the same time exciting and scary. Um, it was the, it's one of the most honest depictions of that experience that I've ever read. Um, and, and, you know, it's like the funny thing about that book was that it's like a classic middle grade coming of age story. There was nothing super special about it. There's no hook. There's no marketing angle about it. It just was really well done and very specific. You know, the kids I handed that book to, they responded to it in the same way that I did thinking of myself as a 12 year old, which is just the mark of like a truly great book. <laughs> yeah. Any, any picture books that you, that you done that you're like, this, this was really good and it should have done better. Any, mm, any books where you're like, eh, I kind of, I kind of thought that was not like, this is a bad book. Yeah. You no, don't yeah. Do bad, you don't do bad books. We know. D don't but, do bad books. Yeah. But like, huh. I really thought that would have landed or resonated a lot yeah. better than it well, did. Well, this year is a great example for that because, you know, so many of these books, their sort of lifespans depend on authors going out and touring or going to conferences and talking about them. And of course, like none of the books that came out this year had any of that because Oof, everybody's yeah. stuck at home. So there's one book from my spring list that... Um, <laughs> it's one of the funniest books I've ever worked on. It's called Unstoppable. And it's by, I think you'd like it. I think your kids, I think your kid would like it too. Yeah. Um, it's by Adam Rex, who also illustrates um, books. And he has a book that he authored and illustrated that came out today, actually, called On Account of the Gum. But Unstoppable <laughs> came out in the spring. It's illustrated by this amazing woman, Laura Park. Um, and it's about uh, these forest animals. So that there's there's this crow and a crab and they both escape a cat the crab escapes this cat who's trying to eat him by pinching the cat's nose okay. and the crow escapes by flying away 
And after that happens, they look at each other and they're like, man, I always wished I had claws so I could pinch people on the nose. And the crab goes, well, I always wish I had wings so I could fly. And they look at each other and they're like, we should team up. So they team up and they become an unstoppable team. And then they find, then they team up with a turtle who can swim. And then they team up with a bear, Steve, who can be the brute force. Um, And it's this amazing book that is about teamwork, but it comes from this feeling of like wanting to be a superhero and other people Mm. kind of like telling you that you might already be a super in your own way. But it's like, I don't know, these are themes that come up a lot explicitly in picture books, but normally they're like, they literally will tell you that you can believe in yourself or that you are a superhero. And instead of telling kids that, it models them in this very hilarious, bombastic way that culminates in a team that includes the president and Congress all coming together to save this forest from being turned into a mall. <laughs> so it's pretty epic. The great um, bleeding heart liberal way of doing things, exactly. which we all need. Please remember November 3rd, go out and vote, please. Go out and uh, vote. Yeah. No, it's but Okay. Th- that, and, and that one, that one should do pretty well. I, it should, you know, and I think it will, cause people know Adam, the author, the author's name and he'll be out in the world um, and and supporting a future book. So I think they'll come back and buy it. But that's another like that's a great example of a book also that is a really fun read aloud because every time they team up with a new animal, they say unstoppable. And it's a great like moment in a classroom when you can have all the kids say unstoppable together. That, of course, like because we're not all together, we can't do it. So it's like, you know, it's one of those books that's just a sad story because of covid along with every other sad covid story right right but no i you know, I, i'm pulling it up as, as we're talking it you know it yeah. does it is a you know it is a very well done book you're like yeah. okay it, it, yeah. as, when you look you know there's that I, there's kids illustration there's 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 editorial there's there's whimsical that word that gets thrown around ad nauseum um yeah. but it's like yeah this really you know it's like oh yeah you know, i may have to break down and buy a book but, oh, but good. It, it, it does Go make sense it. that uh um that that would be a, a book that you guys would publish because it does it, it, it does look like a really fun, cute story. It is fun. Um, and it's also like if you buy it or if you're you know, if your listeners know it, it um it's a great model for how to use page turns. Okay. Um and it's a longer book too. I think it's fifty six pages. Um it is a long and book, each yeah. Each of those, yeah, a, t- a typical picture book is 32 pages, um, and each of those pages we really needed. So we actually expanded the page count from the beginning because it just, the way, the the pacing of the illustrations, particularly in the beginning, it really relied on on more to happen, more frames in the film, really, than, than we had room for with the standard page count. So we added pages to that. I can't cool. see why this was published because yeah. I'm looking at it going, oh, wow, that is a very well done design <laughs> work. Okay. All right. Yeah. A lot of, a lot cool. of, you know, action, a lot of wide establishing, a lot yeah. of, a lot of, uh, good uh, yes, feelings. Exactly. Like, yeah. I could yeah. see that if I have to read this aloud or read it yeah. in a lap, it, it yes. it's going to play. It does. And, Which, and one thing you can look at too, um, speaking of animation, I don't think Laura did any animation, but she does do a lot of work on graphic novels. And so there is sort of like, there's little kind of speech call outs in this. You can yeah. see that she, and especially the way each sort of some of the pages in the beginning are structured. You can see that she, you know, is, is, uh, somebody who knows what she's doing as far as sort of visual, um, narrative movement. Yeah, this is it, it is a lovely little book. So I'm gonna we're gonna have to wrap it up because we can spend yeah. all day, you know, poo pooing on people and books we don't like and talking about <laughs> wonderful things. So just to wrap it up, what is the number one thing that you as an editor want people to do before they throw this manuscript at you? Mm. Yep. What's that one thing you really want people to think about? I want you to do two things. One Read it out loud to kids that you don't know. So not your kids, not your nephews, but go volunteer for a library story time. There's a great national tutoring program called 826 National that has branches everywhere. Boys and girls clubs, you can find a place to volunteer. Or on Zoom. Like now that everything's virtual, I'm sure there are many volunteer virtual story times that you can take a look at. Ideally, this happens in person, honestly, because you really want the minute by minute reactions to things. Um, So that's one thing. And then once you have done that and you learn that kids are not laughing at certain jokes, but are laughing at certain jokes and you adjust your manuscript or your book accordingly, 
then I want you to hand over that book to somebody, a friend, a teacher, a librarian who's never read it before and have them read it to a bunch of kids and see what happens there. And like watch what happens. Watch where those laughs come in. Take notes on the reaction if you can. Um, because what you're doing when you write a picture book or, you know, write and illustrate a picture book, you're essentially creating a script that you're handing out to every parent, every teacher, every librarian to act out. <laughs> It's a huge job right. that you're doing because you're never going to get to be the one reading it. One percent of the time, maybe, will be right. you reading it. Right, right, yeah. So, and, sure. and you have no control over, over how other people are going to read it. So you got to make it perfect according to somebody else, which is a really hard thing to let go of for people. But, like, you, it's funny to, to walk in on somebody reading a book that you've worked on or that you've written yourself because you'll be like, that's not how that voice sounds or that's not, you know, Miss Frizzle's voice because you have it a very specific way in your head. But the ultimate test is whether you can hand it to somebody else who's never seen it before and they don't stumble over any lines. They get the laughs where the laughs are supposed to come in. The kids are riveted. They aren't requesting you to turn the page before you want them to be requesting you to turn the page. Like that's the sort of ultimate test. It is more like a script that you're giving them than, than, you know, a map. I, I, you know, I think just to distill that down, I think something you just said is, is, is shocking that no, that I've never <laughs> thought of it. It's like, you're never going to read this out loud ever again once you sign the contract. Yeah. So get over it. Yeah. It's well, you and, and you know, it's not it isn't yours, yours anymore. anymore. And if you get to read it aloud, you might get you might go on tour, you might do school visits, you might read it, you know, to librarian panels or whatever. And that's great. But you're not going to be in the homes with the kids reading at night after night. You're not going to be in the classroom sitting on the square of rug on the circle with the kids getting reactions. And so the more of those real time, authentic experiences with your book you can observe the better. It will teach you so much about the way the book actually functions. Um, and there's there's no, really, there's no replacing that. If you have done that before, if you've done that before you submit the book and you say, I've read this to five classrooms of kids and I've observed five other classrooms of kids have it read to them. And so I know it works. I would respond to that as an editor. I've never seen anybody do that in my life. So mm. it would be shocking if it did. And some of them, ha some of them don't tell me and they've already yeah, done sure, that work. Sure, you know? but, no, but, that, but like, that, that's yeah. a, that is the one thing in a cover letter that I'd be like, huh, okay, I'll take a look at this. Other than that, I'm just going to read the manuscript because there's right. no, like there, a, a cover letter is as good as you are at writing cover letters. It has really nothing right. to do with right. the book itself. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. That, that, Okay, that is a lot. I hope people take a lot of notes, and I will not pitch you my terrible story idea because there's a lot, <laughs> a lot of work to do, which is really okay. heartbreaking. But I will. Don't pitch it yet. <laughs> we'll pitch, pitch it. it yet. Go exactly. fix it, and then we'll talk. I will go. I will go fix it. All right, Taylor okay. Norman from Chronicle Books. Thank you so much. This has been great, and I hope everybody listening to this uh, inundates you with extremely well thought out and prepared manuscripts going forward. I hope so, too. I will look forward to that. And thank you so much, Bobby, and thank you to all of your listeners for their interest. It's really cool to find a community of people that um, care about this stuff because that's how we make really good books and wonderful art. So thank you so much. So there you have it. Everything you absolutely need to know about publishing your children's book. I hope that's given you some good ideas. I hope that has given you the desire to write your story, illustrate your story, and talk to people and collaborate on creating a children's book. Because if you've never really sat down and read a children's book, if you don't have kids, a children's book really is something that is so precious to a child. Think back to some of the books you had and how near and dear they are to your heart. I still remember titles like The Gorilla Did It and, of course, Green Eggs and Ham and one of my favorites, Hop on Pop. So if you have the opportunity or the desire to create a children's book, please do it because you are creating literature. It's not just a funny book of pictures. It is literature. And if illustration is a career you're interested in, be aware that employers are always on the hunt for the next generation of talented and skilled creative professionals. And here at Academy of Art University, you will get those work-ready skills that employers want. You can study on-site in downtown San Francisco, and of course, anywhere in the world right now with our online programs. To request info about our 40 plus areas of study in art and design, including illustration, game development, UX design, and more, Visit our website at academyart.edu slash creative mind. Hey, hit that subscribe button before you leave, and thanks for listening.